Hello, my name is Jeff Messier. I'm a professor in electrical and computer engineering in the Schulich School of Engineering. And this is module 28 in my computer networks lecture series where I talk about queuing theory. And queuing theory is a very rich branch of analysis that we will use to analyze the probability that a router or a switch in a network is going to drop a packet due to buffer overflow. And this analysis is also going to give us the tools we need to figure out how big our routers or our router buffers need to be in order to give us a certain level of reliability in terms of uh, the probability of drop packets. So to start off this discussion, let's first of all talk about how packets get lost on the internet. And the reality is that losses of packets on the internet due to physical layer noise and Mac collisions are actually pretty rare. The, the possible exception is for wireless links, like wireless links do have a lot of interference and you know signal strength problems in some cases. You know, the, um, the ARQ algorithms that are built into wireless standards, Wi-Fi standards, are good enough to clean up a lot of lost packets. Um, and so you tend to have situations on wireless links where you know you either get very slow throughput because you're getting a lot of retransmissions or you can't get coverage at all. So anyways, the reality is that link level packet losses are you know, relatively rare. And one of the primary mechanisms that packets are lost on the internet is actually due to router buffer overflow. And so we have a situation where, you know, we maybe have a router that has several incoming traffic streams. You know, there may be several links that are feeding into this router and packets are arriving on each of these links. And I've, I drew this picture, these, this picture with some care because the arrival, like the, the traffic patterns of these incoming packets are essentially random. So the, the time that the packets arrive on these input traffic links is random. And even the lengths of the packets themselves are random. Sometimes we have very long packets, sometimes we have very slow packets. And the router will um, buffer all of the packets that it receives and try to send it out on its output link. I've only drawn one link here, but of course routers typically have several output links to choose from. But the reality is that these buffers can fill up and in very, very congested high traffic situations, we can have a situation where the buffer is full and the router simply refuses to accept a packet because there's no place to put it. So the packet arrives absolutely successfully, completely intact, passes its CRC error detection, but there's simply nowhere to put it. And so very quietly, the router just drops the packet. And um, just as, as a bit of notation, each packet requires a certain amount of time equal to the number of bits in the packet divided by the throughput of this output link to, um, to clear the router, right? So the, um, and it's this delay, the delay required to just clock the bits of the packet out the output link that results in you know the buffer filling up and and us potentially losing packets so this presents some fundamental questions for people who design networks the first of all the first question is how large do we make the router buffers so we, we don't want this to happen right we don't want to run out of space to put our packets so we need to make the router buffers big but the question is how big and you know, a related question, obviously the two questions are tied together, is, you know, if we choose a buffer of a certain size, what's the probability that that buffer is going to overflow? And so you can sort of see we can come at the, uh, at the problem from two angles. 
for a given router buffer size, what's the probability of overflow? Or if we want to look at it the other way, if we have a certain probability of overflow that our network can tolerate, how big do we have to make our buffer in order to hit that performance target? And queuing theory basically provides us the tools we need to answer these two questions. And I'm going to introduce queuing theory in a, in a generic way, and then we're going to um, take some specific real world values out of our network design case study from module 27 to um, work through some, some more, some practical examples of queuing theory. So we're basically going to take the parameters for the HP pro curve head end switch that we talked about um, as part or that is being used at the University of Calgary. And we're going to take those parameters and we're going to do some queuing analysis and some buffer overflow analysis on that particular switch, just to give, um, give us an idea of how big we need uh, to make buffers in, in that switch and how much traffic the switch can handle. So queuing theory is actually quite an old branch of mathematical analysis that was originally developed by Erlang to analyze traffic on the Copenhagen telephone exchange way before the internet existed. And I'm just going to give you a little bit of a almost just a little bit of a very light sampling of, of queuing theory. We are going to go into some mathematical detail, but queuing theory is a very broad field. And there are some excellent books out there dedicated to the topic of queuing theory. Uh, there's a, a, a classic book written by Kleinrock, one of the original architects of the internet that focuses very specifically on queuing theory. And I'm just going to give you enough to have, sort of have an appreciation and get us to the point where we can do some analysis on, on practical routers. And so we can start our start out our investigation of queuing theory basically just by dealing with averages. So there's a couple parameters that we're going to be working with. The first one is lambda, uh, lambda sub a, or sometimes I'm just going to write lambda. And lambda is basically the traffic, the average traffic intensity that we're, we're experiencing. So it's the average number of packets arriving at our router per unit time. Um, where do we get our values of Lambda? We can basically do a traffic analysis on our system. So we can use a tool like Wireshark or a packet, some packet logging software and basically just look at how many packets are arriving you know, over the period of an hour or over the period of a day. The parameter W is the average length of time a packet spends in the router. This is a, a little bit more complicated to um, determine because it's a function of how many packets are in front of us, how big are the packets, and how fast can the router get rid of the packets, or basically what's the, the, the throughput of the router as it sort of sends packets along their way, along, along its way. However, assuming that we can determine W, there's a very simple formula that allows us to calculate the average number of packets that our router is going to buffer at any any particular time and this formula is called little's formula it's named after little it's not because the formula is little but of course it is a very little formula so the average number of packets buffered by the router is just equal to the number of packets that arrive per unit time multiplied by how long the packets spend in the router before we can we can get rid of them and there's a proof for this formula but it, it's it's relatively intuitive if you think about it and so in a way you know it, it appears like maybe our you know foray into queuing theory is finished right because the whole point of looking at queuing theory is we would like a tool to allow us to determine um how big we need our buffers to be. And right away, the very first formula we've presented essentially tells us how big we need to make our, our router buffers. So 
you know, if we know the average number of packets that we're going to be buffering in our router, why not just set our buffer size equal to L? There's a couple of problems with this. One is when dealing with router buffer analysis, we can't really deal in terms of averages because if we set our, um, our buffer size equal to the average number of packets we expect, assuming a symmetric distribution, we're gonna be dropping packets half the time, right? Because if something is symmetrically distributed about the average, half the time we're above the average and half the time we're below. And all, you can imagine that a packet drop rate of 50% is not going to be acceptable for most uh, network design problems. The distribution is not necessarily symmetric, but I'm just sort of saying that as, as a way of, of illustrating my point. So instead, rather than designing for averages, we essentially have to design for percentile values. For, so rather than saying, let's set our buffer size equal to the average number of packets we expect, we instead say things like, how big should our buffer be if we only want to drop packets 1% of the time? Or... 0.1% of the time. So we basically decide on our packet drop rate and then we determine how big the packet or the buffer needs to be in order to achieve that, that packet drop rate. So to start off our discussion of queuing theory, I want to first talk about something called the rate equality principle. And so let's imagine for, any, uh, for a moment that you are part of uh, an experiment studying the movement of students around campus and you know ignoring for a moment that this would be very creepy and you know not allowed from an ethical point of view let's assume that you've set up cameras to observe the flow of students in and out of a lecture hall and let's say that based on your your camera analysis you um, have determined that students enter this particular particular lecture hall at a rate of 10 students per hour and so the question is if the students are entering the lecture hall at a rate of 10 students per hour what rate would we expect them to leave the lecture hall and the example of course is 10 students per hour so if students are entering a particular room at a particular rate we would expect them eventually to exit the room at the same rate and it's, it's kind of a conservation of flow thing and and if you have an electrical engineering background you know things like you know Kirchhoff's current law and allows us to kind of really sort of understand this at, at quite an intuitive level so all, all the rate equality principle says is that if a system enters a certain state at a certain rate then it's going to exit that um, state at the same rate. And this is actually gonna be one of the tools we use to build up the notion of queuing theory. So in order for us to do that, we have to introduce some notation. So to start, I'm gonna write P sub N as the probability that our queue has buffered n packets. And just as a little bit of terminology, the, the term queue basically refers to um, kind of a, a lineup of things. So for example, when we line up at the checkout counter at a store, people will, will often refer to that as a queue. We're queuing up at the checkout in order to purchase our items and, and leave the store. And so a queue kind of, I guess, refers to sort of a buildup of things waiting for some kind of service. And in our case, our queue is base, basically means the same thing as a router. So a router that is buffering a bunch of packets can be referred to as a queue that has also buffered a, a bunch of packets that will um, eventually be served in some way. And so I will, in this discussion often, refer to 
you know, interchangeably use the term router and Q to refer to basically the same, the same entity. And so PN is equal to the probability that we have N packets in our Q. And this is also when we talk about sort of the probability or when we talk about um, a Q is having a certain state, PN is also the probability that our Q or our system is in state n. So if our Q has two packets in its buffer, we say it's in state number two. If it has zero packets in its buffer, we say that it's in state zero. So um, system state is basically defined by the number of packets that we've got in our buffer. As I said uh, in the previous slide, lambda is the packet arrival rate. per unit time. And mu is equal to the packet departure rate. per unit time. So lambda is basically the rate at which packets are arriving at our router, you know, through all of those input links. And mu is basically the rate at which we can get rid of the packets, um, basically send them along their way along the whatever the next hop is in our network. So let's start off by considering an empty queue or an empty router. So P0 is the probability that we have zero packets in our buffer. We can also think of P0 as the proportion of time our router is empty. So if P0, for example, is 50%, if the probability of having an empty router is equal to 50%, we can also say that half the time our router buffer is empty. And I'm also, as we continue with this discussion, going to introduce the idea of a state diagram. So on the previous slide, I talked about how we define the state of our system as basically being equal to the number of, of packets we have in our buffer. So if we have no packets in our buffer, we're in state zero, and we can draw a state diagram where the nodes represent the different states, and so state zero would just be a node with the, the number zero. And so we're in this particular state on our diagram when our uh, router is empty. And so if P zero is the, the proportion of time our buffer is empty, the rate at which we, or if we have, or if we're in the, the state where our buffer is empty, the way that we exit this state is for a buck or is for a, a packet to arrive in our buffer, right? And so as soon as a packet arrives in our buffer, we leave state zero and we enter state one. And in state one, we have a single packet in our buffer. We're going to in my analysis, I'm going to assume that we can't have simultaneous arrivals. Two packets can't arrive at the same time. So the only state that we can transition to from state zero is state one. Now, the next question I want to answer is what, at what rate do we make the transition from state zero to state one? Well, we know that the overall arrival rate of packets is equal to lambda. So we have lambda packets per second arriving at our router, but our router could be in any possible state. You know, so we, we record, uh, we determine lambda by looking at traffic patterns over a day or over two days. And our router 
during that time is not necessarily always going to be in state zero. But if we know the value of P0, the proportion of time that the router is empty, then the rate at which we transition from state zero to state one is equal to lambda multiplied by P0. And so if I want to say that another way, if lambda is equal to five packets per second, and we know that we're in state zero half the time, then the rate at which we exit state zero is equal to five packets per second multiplied by a half, because that's the proportion of time that we're in state zero. And so if we want to label this transition with the rate at which we follow this transition, it's going to be equal to lambda multiplied by P0. So the total arrival rate multiplied by the proportion of time that we're in state zero. And so just to be explicit about that, lambda multiplied by P0 is equal to the rate at which our system leaves state zero. Okay, so now let's consider state one. So the probability of being in state one, P1, is equal to the proportion of time we have a single packet in our buffer. Now, if we're in state one, we can exit state one in two ways. So we have one packet in our buffer, and one way we can exit state one is for another packet to arrive before we have a chance to get rid of that first packet. If that happens, we now have two packets in our buffer and we make the transition to state two. The rate at which we make a transition from state one to state two is equal to our total arrival rate multiplied by the proportion of time we're in state one. And so you can kind of see what we're doing here, right? We're, we're basically taking our total arrival rate and we're sort of splitting it up amongst all these different transition arrows. So the first arrow is the total arrival rate multiplied by the proportion of time we're in state zero. The next arrow is the total arrival rate multiplied by the proportion of time we're in state one and so on. As you can imagine, in state two, this transition will be lambda multiplied by P2. So that's one way we can leave state one. The other way we can leave state one is if we are able to get rid of our single packet before another one arrives. If that happens, our buffer is empty again, and we make a transition back to state zero. The rate at which we follow this arrow is equal to mu, which is the rate at which we get rid of packets, the total rate that we get rid of packets, multiplied by the proportion of time we are in state one. As you can also expect, if we have two packets in our buffer and we get rid of one of those packets before another one arrives, we're left with a single packet in our buffer. And so we go from state two down to state one. The rate at which we follow that arrow is equal to mu times the proportion of time, whoops, the proportion of time that we're in state two. So you're probably following, following me up to this point, but you might now be thinking it's like, okay, well, what is the point of all this? Why are we drawing these state diagrams? Why am I talking about these state probabilities? Well, remember, our overall objective in this module is to use queuing theory to figure out the probability of buffer overflow. And the probability of buffer overflow is basically equal to the probability that our buffer is full. And so if capital N is equal to our 
buffer size in terms of packets. So let's say we can buffer a total of 100 packets or something like that, n is equal to 100. Then the probability of buffer overflow is equal to the probability of being in state n in our state diagram. So you can imagine, so we have state 0, state 1, state 2. Let's say our buffer size is 100. So we keep drawing this state diagram all the way up to state 100. And if we can solve for the probability of being in state 100, then that is our probability of, of buffer overflow. So basically where we're going to go with all of this is we want to solve for these p-values. Um, in order to solve for the probability of overflow, we're basically going to have to um, write equations for all of these probabilities. And so we've got a bunch of unknowns. We want to write a bunch of equations and we want to solve for, for the probabilities. And so in order to do that, I'll just erase, erase this for a second, we need to start writing equations that will allow us to, uh, we need to solve, or we need to write a series of simultaneous equations that will allow us to solve for these probabilities. And to do that, we can use the rate equality principle. So the rate equality principle, if we start by thinking about state zero, says that, whoops, says that the rate we enter state zero has to be equal to the rate that we leave state zero. The rate that we enter state zero is equal to mu times the probability of being in P1, or sorry, is equal to mu times the probability of being in state one. And the probability of, or and the rate at which we exit state zero is equal to lambda times the probability of being in state zero. And so this is our first equation. And we assume that the values of mu and lambda are known. So we're not solving for those. So we can figure out lambda by analyzing the traffic flowing into our router over a period of time, as I've mentioned. And we can figure out mu based on um, how big our packets are and how fast our router is, basically. So that's our first equation. So we have one equation and two unknowns. So obviously we need more equations. So we can also, we can then write the rate that we enter state one is equal to the rate that we leave state one. And state one is a little more interesting than state zero. There's actually two ways to enter state one. One is, if I use a different color here, one way we can enter state one is from state zero. If a packet arrives while we're in state zero, then we enter state one. However, the other way we can enter state one is from state two. If we have two packets in our buffer and we're able to get rid of one before another one arrives, then we go back down to state one. And so the total rate that we enter state one is equal to the summation of lambda times P zero and mu times P two. The way that we can leave state one is either if we have one packet in our buffer and another one arrives, or if we have one packet in our buffer and we get rid of it before another one arrives. And so the rate at which we leave state one, the total rate is equal to lambda times P1 plus mu times P1. And as you can imagine, we can write a, a the identical equation for state two, state three, and so on. And in general, 
for state in, the rate that we leave state in is equal to lambda plus mu times the probability of being in state n. And that's equal to the rate that we arrive in state n, which is occurs if we have an arrival while we're in state n minus one, or if we have a departure when we're in state n plus one. And so basically where we're going with this is we wanna now start to use this system of simultaneous equations to again solve for those probability values because once we get those probability values solved, that basically gives us the probability of buffer overflow. And so to solve for our prob probability values, we have to work on manipulating our equations a little bit. And so we know that lambda P0 is equal to mu times P1. This was our rate equality equation for state zero. And this allows us to write P1 is equal to lambda over mu times P0. If we write our rate equality equation for state one, we had lambda P1 plus mu P1 is equal to lambda P0 plus mu P2. This can be rearranged to solve for P2, where we can write P2 is equal to lambda over mu P1 plus P1 minus lambda over mu P0. However, if we look at this part of the equation, we know that P1 is equal to lambda over mu times P0. And so this term that I've highlighted basically goes to zero. And P2 is equal to lambda over mu times P1. Or if we want to substitute this equation in, it's equal to lambda over mu squared times P0. And if we, we can continue with this actually, and using sort of similar um, similar algebra, we can write P3 is equal to lambda over mu times P2 or lambda over mu cubed times P0 or in general Pn, the probability of being in state n, is equal to lambda over mu to the n times p0. And so we're kind of simplifying the equation a little bit. We've, you know, we've got these simultaneous equations in a, in a more compact form. But the problem is with this formulation, we always have one more unknown than we have equations. Every time we add a new equation, we add two unknowns. And, or, well, that, that's not exactly right, but we, we have one more, we always have one more unknown than we have equations. And so this kind of formulation that I, I've shown you here, you know, it, it's nice and compact, but we need to add one more equation in order for us to solve, um, to solve for our unknowns. And as it turns out, we're gonna consider sort of two scenarios. One is the infinite length Q scenario, which is gonna give us the extra equation that we need. And then the second one is the finite length Q scenario, which will also give us the extra um, equation that we need. So in order to get that final equation we need to solve for our probability values, we have to go back to some fundamental probability theory. So first of all,
we're guaranteed to be in one of the states in our state diagram. The states in our state diagram represent all possible outcomes for our system. We have to be in one of those states. And so in that way, the states in our state diagram represent the universal set for our experiment. Also, if we're in one state, by definition, we can't be in any of the other states. So those states are mutually exclusive. We can't be in two states at one time. And so the fact that our states are mutually exclusive means that we can add the probability values because you can only add probabilities for outcomes that are mutually exclusive. And the fact that we're guaranteed to be in one of the states, that all of the states represent our universal set, means that all of our probabilities have to add up to one. We're guaranteed to be in one of the states in our system. And that's our final equation. So our final equation for solving for our probabilities is that the summation of our state probabilities has to equal one. Now, as I said, we're gonna consider two scenarios. And the first scenario is what's known as the infinite length Q. So this means our buffer it has infinite size. We can buffer an infinite number of packets. And you might say, well, this is kind of useless, right? Because the whole point of diving into this queuing theory is to figure out how big our buffers need to be. And so if we assume that our buffer is infinite, what's the point? Well, basically consider this as an intermediate stepping stone to the finite state Q. Um, it's, we can learn a few things by looking at the infinite length Q. And as it turns out, the equations are a lot simpler. And so for assignments and exams and stuff like that, I'll sometimes use the infinite length Q scenario just because it makes the math a little bit easier. And so for the infinite length Q, we have an infinite number of states in our state diagram. And the probability of being in one of those states the probabilities of all of those states have to add up to one. And so one is equal to the summation of n is equal to zero to infinity of all of our state probabilities. And we know that the probability of being in state n is just equal to lambda over mu raised to the power of n, p0. Now, as long as lambda over mu is less than one, then we can simplify this infinite summation using an identity, and we can write this as one over one minus mu Oh, sorry, lambda over mu times p0. And the identity that we're using here is, you know, the summation of n is equal to 0 to infinity a to the power of n is equal to 1 minus 1 minus a as long as the magnitude of a is less than one. And so in order for these equations to hang together, we have to have lambda over mu less than one, which basically means on average, we have to be able to get rid of packets faster than they're arriving. And you could, and just pausing there for a second, you could say, well, wait a minute, if we can always get rid of packets faster than they arrive, um, we should never have any, you know, packets in our buffer at all. But remember, these are average quantities. And just because on average, we're able to get rid of them faster than, um, you know, they're, then they're arriving, there's going to be variation around that average, right? And so sometimes we will have packets arrive faster then we can get rid of them. Just like, you know, in a classroom, if the, the average on an exam is 75%, it doesn't mean that always everybody gets 75% on the exam. Sometimes you get higher, sometimes you get lower. But this ends up being a very simple equation. So 
basically we can now write that P0, because this quantity is equal to one. So solving for P0, we can write P0 is just equal to one minus lambda over mu, which then allows us to solve for Pn, lambda over mu to the n times p0, but p0 is just equal to one over lambda minus mu. And so we now are able to solve for the probability of being in any state or having any number of packets in our buffer as a function of lambda and mu, which we assume that we know. So even though we can't solve for probability of buffer overflow for an infinite sized Q, we can solve for some interesting quantities. And one of those quantities is the average number of packets that we expect to have in our buffer at any given time. And if you recall from back earlier in, in the module, that quantity is equal to L. So average number of the packets in our buffer is equal to L, where L is equal to the summation of n from zero to infinity of the number of packets n multiplied by the probability of having that number of packets. And this is just the equation for the average of a discrete random variable, where the average of a discrete random variable is equal to all of the state values, uh, the summation of all of the state values multiplied by the probability of being in a particular state. Oops, get my page lined up there again. And so if we substitute in our equations for state probabilities, zero to infinity n and we know the probability of being in state n is lambda over mu to the n times one minus lambda over mu and then if we use the um, we can simplify this equation if we use the identity that um, you know, if we have k equal to zero to infinity of k multiplied by a to the k, this is equal to a over one minus a squared, as long as the magnitude of a is less than one. This should look familiar because we use this identity to simplify the ARQ equations back a number of modules ago. And so if we use this identity here, L ends up being equal to lambda over mu minus lambda, where you know this part of the equation canceled out the um, the squared part in our identity. And then I just re, you know, I move some variables around to, to kind of simplify it. Um, but this is a very simple formula. So the average number of packets that we have in our buffer in an infinite length Q is just equal to lambda divided by mu minus lambda. And if we want to figure out the average amount of time a packet spins in our router, we can use Little's law. So L is equal to the overall arrival rate multiplied by the average length of time a packet spins in the router. And this is a combination of waiting in line as well as being clocked out of the output of the uh, router. And if we use, the, we substitute the value for L, W is just equal to one minus mu, one over mu minus lambda. And so 
we have two very simple equations. And again, this is kind of why I, I like to consider the infinite Q case, because our equations are, are really simple, um, even though it really is just sort of a stepping stone to the finite case. So just to close off this infinite Q discussion, what I want to do is now do an example, taking some parameters from the HP Pro Curve head end switch that we talked about in, um, in the previous module. And just to sort of do some average, you know, packet buffer um, calculations, just to sort of get our feet wet a little bit, and then we'll move on to the finite Q case, which is more practical, but as it turns out, the equations are a little bit more complicated. Okay, so here's our example. The question we're trying to solve is how much latency do we expect along a six hop path along the internet? So six hops means we have five routers. We're going through five routers. For the following assumptions, our average packet size is 500 bytes, which is about right for the internet. Our router output speed is 10 gigabits per second, which is the case with the pro curve. And our packet arrival rate is 2 million packets per second. So this is a little bit light. So the pro curve can take up to 214 million packets per second. That's its maximum switching speed. And so we're starting out a little bit light. So this is about one one hundredth of the pro curves max switching capacity. And so the latency, since we have five routers on our path is gonna be equal to five times the average amount of time a packet spends in each one of those routers. And so we wanna solve for W, multiply it by five, that's gonna be our latency. And we're gonna assume infinite length Qs. And so we know already what lambda is. Lambda is two million packets per second. We now need to calculate mu, the rate at which we can get rid of packets. And mu is equal to one packet, which contains eight times 500 bits, right? Because this is um, 500 bytes, multiplied by the output speed, basically, of the um, the uh, the router, so we can get rid of ten times ten to the nine bits per second, and that means we can mu is equal to two point five million packets per second. And so um, our latency then is equal to five times W, which is just one over mu minus lambda, 2.5 times 10 to the six minus two times 10 to the six, or in other words, 10 microseconds. And the average number of packets in our buffer, if we want to solve that, just um, to be complete, lambda over mu minus lambda. So if we plug in these values, we get four packets. And at this point, you're probably scratching your head, right? This seems like, well, where where's the problem? You know, we've we've all used the internet before. We know that the delay across the internet is a lot bigger than 10 microseconds, right? We know that from playing online games or using, you know, video chat programs where nobody can seem to sort of keep from interrupting each other because the delay is so great. And, you know, if on average we only ever have four packets in our buffer, then this is no problem. We can just throw a uh, you know, that 180 megabit or megabyte maximum packet size or maximum router buffer size at um, this problem. And we're never ever gonna have to worry about buffer overflow. 
And so this kind of highlights one of the aspects of, of using queuing theory to analyze network performance um, that we need to be cautious of. First of all, you know, the, the values for lambda in particular is, are not constant. You know, so lambda will actually fluctuate a fair bit depending on the time of day and the time scale that we're using to calculate that average. So sometimes lambda will be a lot higher, a lot closer to the maximum rate that we can get rid of packets. And so to um, explore that a little bit further, let's take another value of lambda that's a little bit closer to mu. So to kind of stress test this thing, let's choose values that are much, much closer to the maximum capabilities of our switch. And so we know the HP Pro curve has a maximum total throughput of 288 gigabits per second. So let's assume we've got a bunch of parallel output links that allow the switch to just max out that throughput. So the, all of its throughput is dedicated to just getting rid of packets from its buffer. And so, in that case, our departure rate is going to be equal to, um, you know, one packet divided by eight times 500 bits multiplied by 288 times 10 to the nine bits per second, which is equal to 72 million packets per second. Let's assume an arrival rate that is just super, super close to the maximum. So our system is just about to go unstable. So we'll assume a, um, an arrival rate of 71.99 times 10 to the six packets per second. And with these parameter, parameters, our latency is equal to 500 microseconds or half a millisecond. And the average number of packets we have in our buffer is equal to 7,199 packets. So definitely bigger, but still very manageable values, right? Like half a millisecond is still very low, you know, quite a bit lower than the actual latency we're experiencing on the internet today. And, you know, 7,200 packets, very modest size buffer. And so that's basically where I want to leave off on this infinite length Q um, scenario. We can only ever calculate these averages with the infinite length Q. We can't calculate a probability of overflow because there is no maximum buffer size. So I'm just gonna sort of leave this example here. We're gonna then progress now onto the finite length Q case, which is kind of the main event as far as this module goes. And then we're gonna revisit this exact example with these exact parameters. And we're gonna see how having a finite length Q changes things. So for the finite length Q case, we're gonna follow the analysis, we're gonna follow along exactly the same line of thought that we did for the infinite Q case. The extra equation that we're gonna to need to solve for our state probabilities comes from the fact that all of our state probabilities has to have to sum to one. And the only difference is now that rather than summing from N equals zero to infinity, we sum to capital N where we assume that capital N represents our max buffer size. Where we define our buffer size in terms of packets. So if N is equal to 100, our maximum buffer size is 100 packets for the purposes of this analysis. And so um, this is just equal to n equal to zero to the n lambda over mu raised to the exponent of little n multiplied by p zero. And again, we can simplify this summation 
But because we're not summing to infinity, the summation simplification is a little bit less simple, if you like. So um, we're going to use the identity n equal to 0 to the n, a to the n is equal to 1 minus a to the n plus 1 divided by 1 minus a, right? So we'll just put this over in the corner there. And so then our probability um, summation is equal to p0 times 1 minus lambda over mu to the n plus 1. divided by 1 minus lambda over mu. And so we can solve for p0. One minus lambda over mu over one minus lambda over mu times n plus one. And of course, pn, the probability of being in state n is just equal to lambda over mu raised to the exponent of n multiplied by p zero, which is one minus lambda over mu divided by one minus lambda over mu to the exponent of n plus one, right? So kind of exactly the same line of flow of analysis as for the infinite length Q um, case. It's just the equations are, are a little bit more, um, a little bit more complicated. The average number of packets that we can expect in our buffer is probably the most complicated of the equations. And um, this is equal to lambda 1 plus n lambda over mu n plus 1 minus n plus 1 lambda over mu to the n all divided by mu minus lambda one minus um, lambda over mu n plus one. And to um, find this probability, I used, or to find this equation, I used an identity that simplified the um, summation of n zero to n minus one n times q to the n. So I used an identity for for that summation. I won't bother writing out the identity as well. If you if you're curious, you can Google. Uh, a uh, table of summation identities and you'll find that one there. Um, but yeah, so this is probably the most complicated equation I'm going to write for you. Well, it definitely is, but it's not complicated in terms of hard to understand. It's just, there's just a lot of algebra there, a lot of variables. And you can see why now the finite, um, uh, finite buffer case is a, a little bit more I don't know, it just takes a little bit longer to write down, but the, the fundamentals are the same, right? So we have an equation where we can solve for any 
state probability in terms of lambda, mu, and the, um, the state probability number. We can solve for the average number of packets in our buffer, and we can solve for our latency just according to L divided by mu. So we can then just use Little's formula to um, solve for our latency. So we find L and then we divide that by lambda to get the average length of time a packet spends in our buffer. Okay, so now let's redo our pro curve example from the infinite Q case now that we've got a finite sized buffer. And so I'm gonna start out with our original uh, parameters, a lambda of 2 million packets per second, a mu of 2.5 million packets per second. And of course, because this is, we now have a finite size Q, we have to um, figure out a value for our buffer. And I'm gonna start by assuming N is equal to 2000 packets, which is roughly works out to about a mega, um, a mega byte of um, buffer size which is much smaller than the 180 megabyte maximum that we can have with the, uh, with the pro curve. So if we first of all calculate our probability of overflow, which is kind of the whole point of all of this long discussion. So the probability of overflow is equal to the probability of being in state 2000 and I'm not gonna bother writing out all the algebra, I'm just gonna write the answer here. You guys can um, plug in the equation or the values into the equations um, and, and just double check the work. But this works out to 3.0 times 10 to the minus 195. So a very, very small value we can determine the average number of packets we have in our buffer. And if you plug this into the equation, that big long equation on the previous slide, you get a value, you get a, an answer of four or a value of four. And then the latency, which is equal to five times W is equal to um, 10 microseconds. And again, if I go back to the previous slide, this is the equation I'm using to calculate uh, the value of L. And then I just divide by um, lambda to get W. Now the really interesting thing I wanna point out here is that this value of four and this value of 10 microseconds is basically exactly the same answer that we got for our infinite length Q. And so what we've got going on here is that, you know, even though we have a finite sized Q, the Q is so big, the buffer is so big relative to the amount of traffic that we've got is that it's essentially infinite. You know, if the probability of us actually reaching our maximum buffer size is so infinitesimally small, then we would expect performance basically on the order of the infinite Q. And so the infinite Q is essentially an approximation for this very large buffer that we're working with. And so that's fine, but let's now sort of stress our system a little bit. And so let's use our packet arrival rate of 71.99 times 10 to the six packets per second, our mu of 72 times 10 to the six packets per second. And when we plug in these values, our probability of overflow jumps to 4.335 times 10 to the minus four. The average um, number of packets we have in our buffer is 
954. And interestingly, our latency is equal to um, five times W, which is equal to 66.2 microseconds. And there's a couple of things to, to talk about here. So first of all, you know, we've definitely got more packets in our buffer and our latency has certainly gone up from 10 microseconds to 66.2 microseconds. But let me rewind the, um, the slides a little bit here and let's take a look at our infinite um, Q results for exactly these same parameters. We had 7,200 packets in our buffer and a latency of 500 microseconds. Now that we're using a finite length Q, all of a sudden the average number of packets in our buffer and our latency has gone down. So what's going on here? It seems like we're, we're better, right? Like our latency has actually decreased for um, the finite buffer size scenario. What's going on is we're actually now dropping so many packets that um, you know our, our latency has improved. So we used to have 7,200 packets on average in our buffer. We've now dropped down to 954 just because we're dropping so many. And our latency has gone down just because you know the packets don't have to wait around in the buffer as long because the buffer is so short that if you get in the buffer, if you're not dropped, then you actually don't have that long to wait um, before getting out of the buffer. So, so it, it's deceptive. It seems like we're working better, but we're actually worse because we're dropping um, so many packets. So, um, you know, the, the packet drop rate or the, the probability of overflow, um, I guess on this previous slide, 4.3 times 10 to the minus four, that's quite a bit higher than, you know, 3.0 times 10 to the minus 195, but is it still a lot? Is it too high? Is it acceptable? One way to figure this out is to kind of look at the average amount of data that we're just going to drop um, for this particular probability of overflow. So the number of data bytes that we dropped is equal to our drop rate, 4.335 times 10 to the minus 4, multiplied by the throughput of our switch for this scenario, which is 288 gigabits per second. And let's consider a, a 24 hour period where um, in 24 hours we have 86,400 seconds. And if we do this calculation, we find that we drop about 9.8 terabytes of user data. So obviously this is way too high. We can't be dropping 9.8 terabytes of data over a 24 hour period. It just wouldn't be acceptable. And, you know, if we sort of go back, we've kind of handicapped ourselves here a little bit, right? So this buffer size of 2000 that we've chosen is really far below the buffer size that we actually could get with the pro curve. And so let's now do a, a final calculation where we sort of use kind of the maximum possible values for all of our parameters. And so let's assume, you know, our, you know, we'll stick with the very high values for lambda and mu that we started with, but now Let's use a buffer of n is equal to um, 100,000 packets, which is much closer to um, kind of what the, the pro curve will, will offer us. And if we redo all of our calculations, I'm not going to do all the algebra, I'll just show you the values. 
the probability of overflow, then drops to 1.289 times 10 to the minus 10. The average number of packets we have in our buffer is equal to 7,199. Our latency is, which is the same as um, our infinite Q case, right? So now we've got a buffer that's big enough that we're starting to you know, approximately approach the, um, the infinite Q uh, performance. Our latency, five times W is almost, but not quite the same as the infinite Q case, 499 microseconds rather than 500 microseconds. And the number of, or the amount of data that we drop in a 24 hour period is now approximately equal to 400 bytes of data, which is a much more acceptable value. So once we sort of put all of the realistic parameters for the pro curve into our calculation and we max out that switch throughput, we get much more acceptable performance. So now, just as a, as a little bit of a, of a closing comment, you know, you could say, well, yeah, no, it's nice that this all sort of hangs together, but you know, if, if this is sort of, if these are kind of finally the typical values for a typical switch that we would find on the internet, how come our latency is often way higher than 499 microseconds? And how come we do lose more than 400 bytes on you know, typical transfers? And it has a lot to do with the very um, non-stationary nature of the, of the internet. It is very idealistic for us to assume a particular value of lambda and a particular value of mu and just expect that to sort of be constant for all circumstances, times of day. Um, we know traffic varies widely and wildly on the internet, depending, um, you know, is it nighttime? Is it daytime? Is it the weekend? Are people watching Netflix? And so there are situations where Lambda can, you know, get a little bit higher than mu. Um, for certain periods of time, switches will get overloaded and the bulk of the traffic will get dropped. Um, it's not that the network isn't working properly, it's just that there will be these edge cases where you know switches will get overwhelmed uh, from time to time. So queuing theory is a, a useful tool in the toolbox to sort of give us you know ballpark estimates for buffer size and how we expect our switch to perform. But we always have to remember that the assumptions that we feed into this analysis don't necessarily always reflect what's going on on the real internet.